We're good to go. We're live. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks, everybody. We must just make a last minute security check, make sure there are no protesters, because I don't want to get glitter bombed. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, uh, to the second event um, in this series. Uh, and today we're talking about uh, connecting uh, communities. Um, welcome to all of you here in person um, and to everyone online. Thank you all for, for coming and thank you for sparing the time. We've had really strong interest in this series of events and we've got over 100 people online today. Um, the three events in total, we've got over 500 people um, showing interest, so it's really great, um, a great opportunity to come together uh, and talk to uh, some really important themes for the future of our railways. I want to actively encourage uh, participation today. Um, we've got over half an hour for question and answer session after we've heard from our speakers, um, and that goes for the people in the room um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of questions and answers, but also there's an opportunity for those online uh, to pose questions um, through the YouTube chat box, and we've got web chat, so um, there's some more details for those who are online um, to follow in terms, of, uh, in terms of what you need to do, and those questions will come through to me, and then we can uh, hopefully draw that into the, into the discussion. So, welcome. So this is part of Steer's Global Rethink Rooms, um, exploring topics relevant to cities, infrastructure, and transport. It's a safe space to explore, to challenge, uh, and to unlock complexity. We started this series with a successful event last week uh, in Birmingham, where we were joined by Andrew Haynes, Alistair Gordon, Maggie Simpson, and Maldrury Rose. Uh, and we heard uh, a really Im impactful discussion as part of that session around economic growth and productivity. It's seemingly a long time. A week is a long time in the politics of our railways, however. It's easy to see last week's announcements uh, as further evidence of a loss of confidence in rail. Uh, but we have the largest investment program uh, in rail in my lifetime, I think. Uh, maybe ever since Victorian times, I'm not sure. Rail carried 1.4 million passengers last year despite the post-COVID impact on rail passenger demand and despite the industrial relations situation. That was more passengers than we carried in 2011, as recently as 2011. You know, rail is carrying high volumes of passengers, and compared to the decades before 2011, we're carrying twice as many passengers even today than we were back then. So how does our railway respond to the challenge of connecting communities uh, in what are testing times financially? How does the railway meet national financial and performance objectives at the same time as meeting local needs? How can it support the need for growth in sustainable housing? And how should the success of community rail partnerships be built on? We're going to hear about all of that this morning. And we have a great panel of guests to help us with that. We're going to start with presentations from three of our guests. So we've got Vernon Everett, the Transport Commissioner for Greater Manchester. Vernon has a track record. Uh, uh, across transport and infrastructure with a deep knowledge uh, of customer service, innovation and connecting mu communities. We've got Martin Tugwell, the CEO of Transport for the North, a specialist in transport and infrastructure planning with a strategic vision through, uh, through nationally recognised leadership. Paul McMahon, the Director of Planning and Regulation at Network Rail, Paul has two decades of experience across infrastructure and regulation, and he's responsible for Network Rail's strategic plan and its five-year funding settlement. After we've heard from Vernon, Martin, and Paul, uh, we'll then be joined in a panel discussion by our final two guests. 
Tricia Williams, the Chief Operating Officer and Managing Director Designate of Northern Trains. Tricia leads the team out there delivering journeys for customers every single day across the north of England. And we'll be joined by Dan Coles, Director at, in the Community Rail Network. Dan specialises in uh, stakeholder management, uh, community engagement, and we'll be hearing from him as well. Some practicalities this morning. As I've said, we're going to hear three um, scene setting presentations. We're then going to move into that panel discussion and that will then move us into question and answer. As I've said, there's an online chat function for those of you online. Please do uh, come forward with questions uh, via that route. And when we get to the appropriate point, those of you in the room, please raise your hand and uh, I'll come to as many of you as I can in the time that we've got available. And we really welcome your comments and feedback on this, on this session. We'll be drawing this session to a close just after 10.30. And for those in the room, there's then a further opportunity uh, for in-person networking. So look forward to that as well. So without any further comment from me, I'm going to start off with our first presenter, Vernon Everett, Transport Commissioner for Greater Manchester. Yeah. Morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. So um, I was just toying with uh, what to say in my allotted 10 minutes, and I thought what I'd try and do is just put rail in the context of the broader strategy that we've got uh, in Greater Manchester to improve public transport uh, and active travel uh, for this rapidly growing uh, region. So... Uh, you, you may have seen around the city, you see, certainly see on my pocket here, uh, the, the symbol of the bee, uh, which emanates from 150 years of history and the worker bees of uh, Greater Manchester during the Industrial Revolution. And that, as you walk around Manchester, is on, on civic buildings. It's even tattooed on uh, a number of people uh, around, the, around the city. But it's the symbol of a an aspiration, and, not, and more than an aspiration now, delivery on the ground of an integrated public transport and active travel uh, network. So we are joining up Metrolink, the tram network here, biggest tram network in the UK, one of the biggest in Europe, actually, and integrating that with the buses. And I'll talk about bus franchising in a minute. Uh, we then are going on to integrate uh, the suburban rail network in, in, into the B network and it's all also wrapped together with a, a very, very ambitious active travel programme being led by Dame Sarah Storey, who's the active travel commissioner uh, for Greater Manchester. And a thread will be run through it all with integrated fares, ticketing uh, and information provision. And of course, um, and this is one of the things I worry about a little bit, um, this, it's not about the transport itself. It's about what it enables. It's all about delivering productivity, jobs, new businesses. The businesses are booming uh, uh, here. The creation of new businesses is booming. The population is, is booming. Um, parts of Greater Manchester, particularly this bit uh, in, in the centre and Salford, are growing faster than any other, any other metropolitan part of the, uh, of the country. And all of that needs to be enabled in a sustainable way. And we've got big mode shift targets. Uh, currently, two-thirds of people in Greater Manchester travel by car. You can't blame them. Uh, we are uh, seeking to improve the public transport and active travel offer to give them some, some different options and some new options. Uh, but we've got to do that to get that two-thirds down to nearer a 50-50 split. And remember, a lot, of great, a lot of Greater Manchester is actually rural. So you, you have to bear, bear that in mind, too. <laughs> And of course, it all goes towards uh, sustainability, decarbonisation. The biggest contribution that the transport system can make is to enable that mode shift. We're introducing electric buses and, and all, of the, all of the conventional things that you would expect, but shifting mode will be the biggest single contributor uh, to better air quality uh, and, and to decarbonisation. So, bet you can't guess what the painting colour of everything. 
Uh, hopefully you've seen some of the new buses uh, rumbling around the centre of town. Um, and this slide is just designed to, to give you a sense of, of how we'll tie uh, everything together and present an integrated network to the people and businesses uh, of, of this region of three million people. So first of all, I want to speak uh, quickly about buses. I know, and last week, goodness knows, um, you know, we, we, we had a lot about rail. And incidentally, just going back to the, the point I was going to make on, uh, on value, I think some, one of the things that worries me is that we're just viewing transport through a lens of cost and forgetting the value that it actually delivers. And it, I think that's a really, uh, I think we have to re-win collectively as an industry to re-win the argument that investment in transport actually enables so much else. And the value of that falls not just to the p and well, not all, not all to the p and of the operators, but to developers, to people who benefit from uh, those improved links uh, and so on. And I think it's so important that we re-win that argument because I, just relentlessly viewing things through cost is quite debilitating for the, for the, whole, um, for the whole industry. Anyway, first of all, on buses. So the, the, bu the bus network, uh, it, uh, like everywhere else in the country except London, was deregulated in 1986, and the mayor, Andy Burnham, and the 10 district leaders are bringing it back into public ownership. And we've started that, and the reason for it is not because it's nice to paint it yellow. The reason is so that we can plan the bus network more effectively, both taking into account local community demands for, for new bus routes and more frequent services, but also for the first time to look strategically at the, at the bus uh, network in Greater Manchester and what it can do. Now, the yellow uh, lines here is, is, is uh, the Metrolink tram network, uh, and two weeks ago, uh, the first phase of bus franchising actually came into operation in Wigan Bolton, certain parts of Bury uh, and Salford. And that will continue uh, in three tranches. So March next year will be the rest of Bury, Salford and Rochdale and Oldham. And then by January 2025, the south of Manchester as well. And at that point, uh, the mayor and the combined authority here will be taking the PL risk of, of the bus network, but also will have all of the levers available to um, uh, on fares, on planning, uh, and on frequency of services, uh, um, and really just running a thread through, uh, through the whole network. So that's uh, bus franchising, and by January 2025, we will have tap-and-go London-style payment for Metrolink and all the buses. So we've, we've, pr we've produced integrated fares uh, at the moment, but you can't just tap-and-go. You have to think up front about what, what ticket you want to buy. By January 25, you just tap-and-go. Now, rail. Um, we also have an ambition uh, by the end of the decade to integrate some of the core suburban rail routes uh, into the B network, and this uh, illustrates them at the moment. And they, again, have been chosen because they are the key commuter corridors into and out of Greater Manchester, and for leisure, uh, and all the rest of it. Incidentally, Metrolink last week, over 100% of pre-COVID. Um, and buses are nearly there, and uh, I, I know demand uh, here in the north for, for rayon, I'm sure Trisha will comment on that, uh, is also booming as well. It is not true that people don't want to travel anymore. <laughs> Travelling differently and to different patterns, but it's not true that people uh, are not travelling anymore. Anyway, uh, the, these lines are the lines that we will integrate by the end uh, of the decade into that integrated uh, tram bus network and we're doing it through a series of trailblazer commitments so agreements between the combined authority and government on further steps to devolve responsibility and accountability for transport uh, to the mayor uh, and and the districts so integration of local rail by 2030 i've mentioned pay as you go fares and ticketing i'll talk in a second about how we're going to roll that out 
a new partnership with the Greater British Railways transition team, which is working really, really well. Uh, there's a proposal to brand certain of our central Manchester stations in an integrated way, again to demonstrate to people that you can, uh, it, it's, it's a transport hub, not just a railway hub. We are, we've established and signed heads of terms with uh, Network Rail on establishing a commercial vehicle to drive the regeneration of central Manchester's six central stations and Stockport. Now, uh, a lot of this has come into sharp relief with the private funding that needs to be harnessed in order to complete HS2 Old Oak Common into Euston. It's this sort of thing that we're talking about here, where we get together with the landowners in and around those stations uh, and we hatch a plan to look at that as an estate to attract uh, third-party investment from developers and others. Because as you can probably see, as you move around Greater Manchester, there are lots of shiny buildings but the stations have not kept pace with it. Um, so big ambitions there. We have a Northwest Regional Business Unit, an emanation of the Rail North uh, Partnership, which looks at services into and out of Greater Manchester. And a Greater Manchester Rail Board has been established to get everybody together, Network Rail, TFN, to have one conversation through the lens of this region about rail, because um, otherwise, you have to have umpteen bilateral conversations uh, about that with different parties, and we need to view it through the lens of the regions. So that provides a really useful forum to get everybody involved in rail together to talk about it. So big, big ambitions on the rail side of things to bring that within the, uh, within the B network. Um, these two lines, it's been agreed with government that we will trial in 2025 <coughs> pay-as-you-go ticketing on, uh, on rail. So the Hadfield to, uh, to Piccadilly line, uh, which I think is wholly yours, Tricia, and um, Staley Bridge to, to Victoria, which is served by UN and, and TransPennine Express. So uh, we'll get on with that. I think it will prove uh, that integrated ticketing reduces barriers to people using public transport. More people will use us and we'll get it rolled out across uh, the suburban rail network here. Just to, fi uh, to finish off, um, just a few issues which we won't be able to explore, maybe we'll pick up on questions, I don't know, uh, but a few core issues for, th for the B network. First of all, I've talked about bus franchising, we're on with it, it's underway. Uh, Liverpool City Region are going the same way, West Yorkshire are consulting on it. I'm on the board at Transport for Wales, we're getting on with franchising in Wales as well. So we're getting on with it, and actually it's proving to be cheaper to franchise things than it is to replace the commercial buses that are being taken off at the moment across the country. So the cost of actually stepping in to replace those on commercial terms when, they, when they're withdrawn uh, has, has been uh, rapidly growing. With, with franchising, you specify the amount of money that you're going to pay for a certain degree of service, so you have certainty on cost. And then it's our obligation, Greater Manchester's obligation, to drive up revenue. Uh, tackling road congestion. The biggest enemy of the bus network is road congestion. We've got enough buses, we've got enough drivers, uh, but we need to think about the road network as a network, get lane rental in, um, and perhaps some judicious use of red routes in this area uh, where, uh, where that holds up the overall uh, traffic. That's not an anti-car statement. Dealing with these sorts of issues will actually free up uh, the roadway for, for car journeys as, as well. And then we've got a whole program of bus priority, looking at junctions, all of the things that you'd expect. Rail services and investment infrastructure, uh, I think the people of Felix are still reeling from discovering that they're in the north uh, <laughs> fr fr from, from last week. But the serious point is, you know, we just need to regroup after all of that. Uh, and, and look at, uh, and the, the northern mayors are, are getting together to take stock uh, and, and, and pick through the aftermath of those announcements uh, and see what we make of it. Uh, so I won't go into it all here, but uh, clearly it's, a, it's an enormous deal. We have a customer growth strategy. We, uh, uh, we have a segmented strategy for events, for example. Man Man the, the, the way Manchester behaves is very heavily affected by big events. 
So if United are at home and there's a big gig somewhere and the cricket's at Old Trafford, the whole complexion of the region changes. So we're, we're looking at that and looking at ways in which we can incentivise more people to use public transport and active travel uh, to, to, to alleviate some of the difficult conditions on the roads that are caused uh, during those. And, and, and we have a whole customer growth strategy uh, uh, led by Fran Wilkinson, actually, who, who's ex-Morrisons ex and is taking a sort of a retail approach to this. Get, the Get On Board campaign, we've intervened big time on fares. I was shocked to discover that it was £4 single for a bus journey here. It's one seventy-five in London, and you can tap and go for as, long as, you, as many bus journeys as you like within an hour. So the Mayor in September last year intervened, halved the fares, uh, and uh, that, that drove patronage up by around 10% in, in, in a quarter. Uh, I've mentioned integrated fares and ticketing. Crime and antisocial behaviour, there are more ticket inspectors and travel support officers on the ground in and around Greater Manchester, including bus interchanges to clamp down on low-level antisocial behaviour and crime. Got a really good relationship here with Greater Manchester Police as well. And uh, uh, they now treat the public transport network as the 11th district of Greater Manchester and police it accordingly. There are 10 boroughs. The 11th borough, if you like, is the transport network and it's policed accordingly. And we have uh, big ambitions for our cycle hire scheme and for all of the infrastructure investment which is going in uh, on cycle lanes uh, to, to enable walking, wheeling and cycling. Final thing, uh, none of this happens without money. We are grateful for the money that's been given to us by government. The City Regional Sustainable Transport Settlements, which are five-year capital settlements, are very useful. Uh, and uh, actually a second wave of those w was announced in amongst all the other stuff last week. Um, but we also need to talk uh, about the way in which we fund this from a revenue perspective as well. There is no public transport service in the world, particularly bus service, that completely washes its face as a network. There may be some lines that do or certain routes that do, but if you're looking at it in the round as a network, there will always be a requirement for some form of revenue support. The obligation on us as operators is to make is to minimise that, get the revenues up, and and, uh, and and bear down on that. But we do need a different conversation on the funding and financing of public transport and active travel, so that we get steady and sustained support uh, for for everything that's been done here and in many many other city regions uh, around the country. Uh, so I hope that's helpful. Big ambitions here, and I know many people in this room are partners in getting all of that done. So thank you for all of your uh, uh, help and support in, in getting those plans uh, underway and, and actually on the ground. Thanks, Richard. Vernon, thank you. A wide sweep of really critical topics and themes relevant to, to this morning's discussion. Um, can I turn now to Martin, Martin Togwell, to come and speak, please. Thanks, Richard, um, and good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, I like the title, Rethink Rooms, because I think, as a transport profession, we've got to really take a long, hard look at ourselves and think why have we been doing things wrong? I sit in too many conversations where we're talking as a profession about the need to do things differently. I'm old enough now to have been involved in those conversations long since we had the Brundtland definition of sustainable development 30 plus years ago. So if we as a profession are saying we need to do things differently, it's the profession that's been saying that for 30 years, so why have we not made the difference that we want to make? So I think rethinking is really important. Um, I was reflecting in preparing for this that um, I like to spend my Sunday mornings going through the Sunday papers and um, catching up on not just the news but also some of the analysis. And I came across a reflection in an economist a few months ago who made the observation that an economist had said, if you choose the wrong unit of analysis then good intentions lead you in the wrong direction at breakneck speed. To illustrate why I think that's important, we're talking about communities. So we often talk, 
When we talk about communities, we start talking about how do we deal with housing development, how do we deliver more growth in housing, what have you. And lots of us involved in those conversations will start talking about affordability, housing affordability. And I really do despair when we get focused on that as why we're trying to do things differently. Because what are the two things that go into housing affordability? One is the average cost of your house, and the other is your average salaries. Now, last time I looked, a lot of people see their house and their value in their house as part of their retirement package. So if we actually think that we want to reduce the average price of houses, you're going to impact on people's personal wealth. And I don't see that being a vote winner. Likewise, human nature being what it is, if you increase average salaries, human nature in most cases tends to be that we look to go even better than we can afford in terms of housing. So if we've chosen housing affordability as one of our key factors to drive some of our investment decisions, we've actually fundamentally misunderstood what we're trying to achieve. We've got the wrong measure. I think it was... Um, Galbraith, which made the observation about uh, economic forecasting exists to make astrology look reasonable. And there's some real, yeah, there's some real things in, to think about here. It's why when we've done the strategic transport plan for uh, the North, the second version of which we're just uh, in the process of finalising, the focus has been about what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Outcomes expressed in terms of the economy, society and the environment. It's why the work we've done on the Northern Powerhouse Independent Economic Review is so important, because it's the demonstration as to what the actual economic value of getting the North transformed is for the benefit, not just of the North, but the UK. £118 billion a year extra in GVA if we get this right by investing. Social. Over 3.3 million people in the North currently live in areas of high risk of being excluded from society because either they can't afford or they haven't got access to transport that gets them to opportunities, services, uh, uh, life experiences. That's over 20% of the population now. So again, when we start talking about delivering communities, we often get so obsessed about dealing with new housing we ignore the fact that there is a significant and sizable proportion of our population that are excluded already. And if they are excluded, they're actually not realising their potential and we're not delivering the potential of the North. And then it comes to environment. And then when you look at the programme that we've got in terms of delivering decarbonisation, which is not just about the environment, it's actually an economic opportunity, talking to somebody outside in the, in the coffee break uh, before we started... Look at the amount of investment being put into decarbonising the American transport system. It's an economic driver, as well as being an environmental necessity. All comes back to thinking about what is the driver, what is the framing of the question that we're trying to solve. And that's the challenge for us as transport professionals, framing the question in a different way. As I said, that's why we put in the strategic transport plan outcomes that are around the economy, society, and the environment. The next challenge for us as a profession, and Vernon's touched on it a little bit already, we've got to stop looking back. It's not helpful. We're looking back at the moment. There's a bit of a conversation going on for a number of months now about, well, what does COVID mean for transport for the future? Well, for me, the objectives, the outcomes we're trying to achieve in the North haven't changed. We still want to deliver economic growth. We still want to improve social equity. We still want to decarbonise our transport system. Those haven't changed because of COVID. They haven't suddenly lost their meaning. What COVID has done, it's given us opportunities. Because as we've seen and heard, travel patterns have changed. Well, actually, isn't it a good thing that from the rail perspective, we've lost the peakiness of travel demand? Because we know with that peakiness, you had to have extra capacity in terms of rolling stock, which came at a cost, which came at an implication for what we could achieve outside of it. So stop looking backwards. Think about what is it we need to achieve and think about the opportunities we have to deliver it. And in that context, we've got to start recognising more and more that there is not one size fits all. One of the 
interesting things that I discovered when I took on this role a couple of years ago is it became really clear to me how institutionally biased our profession is towards looking at London and the South East as our benchmark. If I think about all of the tools that we use to uh, assess and appraise new railway schemes, it's based upon the Passenger Demand Forecasting Handbook. It's based upon Moira. All things which are actually fundamentally grounded in the London and the South East experience, where you're dealing with a different set of circumstances. You're dealing with pressures on the rail system. You're dealing with the challenge of economic success, which is very different from dealing with Invest, investing to unlock opportunity. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see reports from people from the projects like the Borders Railway or Oakhampton reopening, when suddenly we see that the delivery, the actual number of passengers on the railway, are far in excess of what we thought it would be. We shouldn't be surprised because the figures that we're using, the tools we're using, are constrained and set by our experience in London and the South East, which is a very, very different market. So we've got to think more about what are the outcomes, and we've got to take a better view and think about how we invest, not just within the five-year cycles that we'll hear about in a moment, but also beyond that. I've been involved not just in strategic planning over the years, but development control as well. And I think if you've had experience at both, you start to understand some of the problems and challenges. The number of times I was involved in development control discussions, and you'd have a really confident conversation about how you needed to invest in delivering alternatives and you needed to invest in providing for of other ways of travelling. And then you get to that killer question or killer point in the negotiations where, but if it doesn't happen, we need to plan for just in case it doesn't happen. So then you put in all the road infrastructure, you put in all the other things that actually encourage behaviour that we've already got. Is why you see too often examples like, going back to a previous role, um, I, I helped put in two new settlements into the Devon Structure Plan in the 1990s. It taken 10, 15 years to get the new station at Cranbrook. It should have been there at the start. It's why in south of Bex Bedford at Wixom's, a development that was promoted and developed on the basis that it would have access to a railway station, and yet it took 10 or 15 years before that railway station was in and you wonder why you have these established patterns of travel which are car dependent. It's not easy because you're needing to look beyond the immediate, but it also means you need to look beyond capital investment. And I think, again, Vernon's touched on this already. Um, in the North, we're having some conversations about uh, capital investment, yes. Through the Rail North Partnership, TFN oversees the delivery of the TPE and Northern contracts. And it's a really quite challenging conversation at times to understand that because they have the separation of costs and revenue, where you know there's opportunities to grow the market, it gets constrained because the costs are taken into account in department and revenues are held by the Treasury. And so you have a, dis dis a separation. But more fundamentally, if we're thinking about outcomes, we need to think about what is it we want our transport system to play as part of that wider conversation. I'm really struck by things like uh, have happened in Luxembourg, where you've got free public transport. And of course, it's not free. It costs something to invest in it, and it costs something to make it run and to deliver it. But as a society, they've taken a view that the benefit of having uh, free at the point of use access allows for the benefits in terms of the economy, society, and environment to be realised. And we've got to start thinking in terms of those. Because if we think about, again, communities, we often talk about new growth. But remember, we've got an ageing population. And remember that we know that if we can maintain independent living for longer, people will have better quality of life, people will have better health. And the last time I looked, the health sector and the social sector, social services sector, were two of the biggest areas of under pressure financially. So actually, if you start taking an outcome approach for a community, and you start thinking, what are you trying to achieve for the quality of life of those individuals? Then you start taking into account these wider linkages. 
and our approach to assessing investment needs to be reflecting that. My final thought in terms of communities. We've got to be really careful as a profession in some of our language because it becomes shorthand for the profession, but it actually becomes a hindrance for me in some of our conversations. Communities, we immediately think about housing, people. What about the business community? What about the economic activity that is provided by rail freight providing services to and from major centres of economic? How do we take account or how do we take a, into a decision the economic, social and environmental benefits of a 750 metre long intermodal train compared with maybe a one car unit taking two or three people? It's not an easy conversation to have. But surely if we're thinking about what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve from our transport system and what role we want rail to play as part of that in delivering a community, we need to think about the business community, the jobs community, the economic community, just as much as we do about housing. So I don't have any answers for you per se, because if it was easy, we would have all found the answer to that a long time ago. But as I started off by saying, I really do think there is a challenge for the transport profession. We do need to rethink. We need to reframe a lot of our thinking and our questioning. We need to think in terms of outcomes, broad outcomes, and we need to forget, or we need to be confident to look forward rather than always looking back and thinking about what we've done in the past. Richard, I hope that's given a bit of a thought promotion and, and I look forward to having the, the questions and conversation afterwards. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you. I really think that's thrown the gauntlet down to the transport professionals in the room, so I look forward to some good discussion late, <laughs> later. I think you've also set in context some of the themes that are really relevant across the region uh, in terms of the topic that we're talking about today. So thank you. Our next speaker is Paul McMahon, who's going to give us that national perspective. Right. <clears throat> Thanks, Richard, and good morning to you all. OK, um, I think Martin's... Um, explained it quite well what the uh, the challenges are in uh, trying to identify what the advantages of rail are or put it another way we know rail has got a huge number of advantages but it's how we sort of knit them together in any individual time and place for for different uh, for different communities um what i'm going to talk about is that in fact under any of these circumstances under any scenario or any plan two things are absolutely fundamental and they're you know even more fundamental today than they, they probably ever have been um, <clears throat> firstly, good levels of train performance, so punctuality and re reliability. And secondly, um, efficiency, improving efficiency. I mean, I, and I know, uh, you know, Vernon said, okay, it's more about just sort of grinding out the, uh, grinding down on, on costs. It's about looking at the bigger picture, looking at uh, growing re the revenue base. Of course it is, but we've also got to look at, um, at, at uh, being efficient. We're continually challenged on being efficient, particularly in uh, uh, network rail. And if we do these two things, wherever we are in the country, in, in any community, we'll improve customer satisfaction, that's passenger satisfaction, that's pre, uh, freight um, community satisfaction. We will drive up um, demand, we'll improve the uh, financial base of the industry. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that will help improve uh, stakeholder satisfaction. And in, hopefully from that, then we'll get support from stakeholders uh, in government and wherever else in order to um, do the long-term planning that we want to do. And we can only do this through collaboration. I mean, it's, it sounds pretty sort of glib and it sounds pretty obvious and there's plenty of good collaboration in the industry, but I think we've got to double down on that. Absolutely got to double down on that at this time. We're under a lot, you know, we're clearly under a lot of, under a lot of, uh, under a lot of pressure. We know that. Uh, the spotlight's always on rail, it seems, for some reason or another. Um, and we've got to especially collaborate in the absence of, uh, of rail reform and GBR being established. That may be a, a number of years away. Who knows what's going to happen there? Um, uh, GBR was all about alignment, bringing things together, you know, and in integration. And I think that was illustrated well in the plans you got for uh, for Greater Manchester. Um, but if that's not happening at the minute, then we've got to we've got to sort of double down uh, and drive do that collaboration ourselves. Okay. So. 
Train performance and efficiency, um, for those of you who follow the debate, is absolutely central to our um, long-term planning in network rail, the control period planning. Um, I'm sure some of you have followed the debate. Um, it's probably one for the sort of the real, you know, technical uh, technical folks, the uh, the regulatory nerds. Um, this is a process that's been going on for two years. Uh, we published our strategic business plans uh, earlier this year, um, following a load of engagement with Treasury and government over the the previous year. The regulator, the ORR, is is poised to, uh, to make uh, its final decisions. They're due uh, at the end of the month. Um, so we're, you know, wait, waited with that with uh, bated breath. Um, but across England and Wales and Scotland, CP7 will see us get £45 billion. Pounds for that's for OM&R, so there's no enhancement money in, in this. That's a, that's a different story. £45 billion. Pounds. We were actually pretty pleased that that was about a billion and a half more collectively across the, uh, across the countries than we have in CP6. And I know, you know plenty of people have looked at us, particularly this, this all came to uh, sort of fruition at the end of last calendar year. People saying, well, whoa, you know, in the current circumstances, how did, how did you achieve to get more, more money? Well, we, we think we made a pretty good case to government and to Treasury. Um, um, and, you know, and, 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 you know, it's actually quite a good vote of confidence in, in rail that we've, we've got more. Now, downside to that is, since, the, uh, since those funding announcements were made last year, we've seen um, inflation to the tune of about a billion and a half erode the value of the plan. So we can't kind of back where we started, but um, nonetheless, it was, a, it, was a, it was a good announcement. In those plans, or in the England and Wales plan, collaboration is mentioned 59 times. Uh, it's absolutely you know, it's, it's critical to how we, how we deliver that plan. Yeah, that's, that's collaboration with our own people, with the trade unions, it's collaboration with train operators, of course, uh, and collaboration with the supply chain, absolutely key to uh, us making a success of CP7. And because we're so big and we sit central, you know, if, if we're not successful, that's going to have sort of ripple effects more widely on the industry. As part of our plan, we did a huge um, survey jointly with Transport Focus. We surveyed 15,000 users and non current non-users of rail to ask them what their priorities were. Now, for those of you who follow the Transport Focus publications, you know, kind of no great surprise is it more or less mimicked what we know, um, but absolutely reinforced that number one, price of tickets, value for money, and number two, reliability and punctuality are what, um, what those 15,000 people think matters, matters most. Um, so, train performance, again, it's a chart from the, from the plan. I'm not intending to go through all the slices of this pie chart, but what this says, this is the factors in, impacting on train delays, actual train delays for CP6. So, uh, so for the last four years, more or less, four and a bit years, network rail, the sort of darker orange, responsible for about 54% of that. Um, train operators on, on cumulatively over CP6, 46%. So we're, you know, we're kind of in it together. We're jointly responsible for uh, uh, impact <coughs> delay. And of course, if we want to fix it, and this is, this is my whole picture really, you know, we've got to work together. And of course, there's plenty of joint, uh, joint engagement on the ground. Um, but you know, we, we want to get these numbers down uh, and we, 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 need to, we need to collaborate more. However, and another chart, and this is a you know, quite a kind of gruesome chart, frankly. What this shows is over the last sort of nearly 15 years, the industry has been on, you know, leave aside this sort of COVID uh, spike, has seen performance decline. Equally, at the same time, every year, we make train performance uh, projections jointly through uh, joint performance improvement plans or joint performance strategies, and we haven't really hit those, uh, hit those targets. Now, there's a whole... Yeah, there's a whole probably s seminar, if not conference, uh, that can talk about this. Collaboration is not the sole reason why, why we've seen this, but certainly collaboration is one way that we can make that, uh, we can make that better and alter the course of that, uh, that chart going forwards. So that was train performance on efficiency. This is um, efficiency delivery in CP6, so the last sort of five years uh, for England and Wales, and then looking ahead to um, control period seven, we're on target to achieve about four billion pounds of efficiency uh, improvements in CP6. Um, 
and in CP7, actually looking at uh, Great Britain as well, so including Scotland, we're targeting 3.6 billion of efficiencies in our plans. And uh, we hope that the regulator will endorse those when it publishes its uh, determinations in a couple of weeks' time. Again, so much of, much of that comes from things we need to do in, in network rail and, and reorganize ourselves, focus ourselves, improve the way we run the business. But also, uh, a lot of our future plans come from working across the sector, whether it's um, working with joint station management teams with operators, joint asset management plans, different ways of working with the supply chains or enterprise-based models with, with the supply chains. You know, if, you, if, you have a look, if you have a glance at our CP7 plan, you'll see you know, reference on reference to how we need to, to um, work, work together. And if you've been following the CP7 debate, what you'll see is we're trying to cast our CP7 planning in a, in, in a, in a sort of different light. We've, we've described it as market-led planning. Um, and what I mean by this is, conventionally, and it's a little bit caricatured, we, we, we in Network Rail take an asset-based approach. So, you know, the, the bridge is X years old or, the, or the, 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 it's, it's, you know, it's exceeded its uh, use, useful life. We're going to go in there and, and renew that bridge. Of course, the railway's always taken a bit of a market-based uh, view, and the railway's structured like that today. But what we've tried to do over the course of the last couple of years as we've, as we've developed our plans is to, is to encourage our teams internally to, to really look more closely at what the local market needs are. And in fact, Steer did some decent work with us uh, earlier this year to support our um, region's plannings for, uh, planning for CP7. We've got about 500 million of... Um, market-led based savings and, and proposals in, in our CP7 plans, and you can see those uh, uh, described. Um, and we want to drive it a lot more. We think there's considerable more scope for savings. Now, what this will mean is potentially adapting the, the capacity and the capability we would offer on certain different routes across the country. But it's not all a sort of, uh, a sort of bad, bad news story. It's not about sort of degrading a capability. What we would also say is there are opportunities to make things better, make things cheaper, to grow revenue. So if you, if you look at the way we've described it, there's, there's socio-economic benefits as well as, as cost savings. So that was uh, me finished. And all I would just say again, and I think I've said it uh, throughout, is you know, that we're only going to make a success of this if we, if we work together and we double down on collaboration across the industry. Thanks, Richard. Paul, thank, thank you. So we've had three speakers with a wide-ranging set of discussions that are relevant to our topic this morning. So I'm now going to invite our three speakers, plus Tricia and Dan, to join me on the stage here. Um, and we're going to start um, with a group discussion. Right, thank you to the three of you. I'm going to just ask Tricia now if she'd like to make a few remarks in terms of what she's heard so far this morning. Yeah, thank you, Richard. I was listening to the themes, so we've got in there decent organisation, we've got value, not cost focus, we've got collaboration. Um, I just wanted to bring out two other themes. Um, one of them was mentioned by Vernon and, and Martin, and the other one I haven't heard yet. And at Northern, our vision is to make a positive impact in all we do and for all we serve. So we think we have a really unique opportunity with our geographical spread across the North to really support, um, improve society, outcomes and economic growth. And we do that through the first theme I just wanted to mention, which is connections. So we have two and a half thousand services every single day. We stop at 500 stations. And we are serving people who um, often don't have any other means of transport. So connecting communities and customers to opportunities, whether that be education, whether that be leisure, whether that be jobs and employment, we think we have, Rail has a key part to play in that. 
So that was the first point I just wanted to mention, that connection. And 75% of our services connect to long distance rail, but also you add to that, we connect to international connections as well through connections to things like airports. So that connections theme I just wanted to bring out there. I thought that was a, a really important one to bring out. The second one I haven't heard yet is people. So people live in our communities. Uh, we employ 7,000 people directly. Um, we're a main provider of apprentices. We've got the largest number of apprentices um, in the TOC world, so the train operating company world. So we had 100 <coughs> who passed out last year. We've got another 400 who will pass out this year. And that's not just drivers, conductors. That's also deep engineering skills. So we're adding to the skill base of our communities. And we have... Um, we believe about 4,300 people who are supported in employment through our supply chain as well. So upskilling those people who work for us, providing employment for those people who work for us and our suppliers. And also, we run things like skills workshops with the community as well, uh, pre-employment skills workshops. I just wanted to bring out that people and the people who live in communities and work for um, rail industry um, is, is a key theme I, I wanted to just bring out there. Our mantra, I just wanted to end on that. We always think national, we act northern and we deliver locally. So that for us um, drives us to always thinking about how we can collaborate, how we can work with our partners. I'm sure you'll talk about community partnerships. Dan, um, but also what does that mean for us and our actions and delivering against our plan, but we're always coming back to that deliver local and making sure we understand our communities and serve our communities. Tricia, thank you. That's a really great introduction from you. Um, Dan, I'm going to come to you now for the community rail perspective and then we're going to start the Q&A. So over to you, Dan. Absolutely. Um, thank you and morning, everybody. Um, so I think there's, there's a few strings to pull out of those presentations, which I think... Um, were really, really insightful. I think for me, um, from the Community Rail Network, we represent um, about 76 Community Rail partnerships, about 1,200 station groups that are at the voice and at the heart of the community. So I think it's really interesting to talk about that impact on those over and above profit and losses, as, as there was lots of touches on there, about how rail and transport generally can deliver in those communities. So our members deliver on uh, local engagement schemes, they work on mobility and access, which I don't think we've really touched on this morning. I think that's something we can, we can think about. Um, also around confidence in rail and the ability to use rail. And I think um, as we continue to promote that and we continue to consider the social impact, I think we have to think about how do we get more people using rail and how do we make it an, an accessible option. Um, so lots to, lots to pull out from that. Um, I think it was really interesting to talk, uh, I think it was, it was you, Martin, to talk about London and how <coughs> there, there was that impact. I think from a community rail perspective, we're talking about, um, there's lots and lots of them in the north particularly, we're talking about rural communities, we're talking about smaller towns, we're talking about smaller cities as well. And I think the connections, as you said, Tricia, is really important. So um, lots of really good stuff and I think there's lots for us to go at today as well. Great. Thanks, Dan. That's really, really good. Now, we've got loads of questions coming in um, online, and I'm going to start with, with one of those, and then I'll come to, to people in the room in a little bit. So the first question, I think perhaps picking up on um, some of the topics that Vernon and Paul touched on in terms of, um, on the one hand, local uh, uh, service delivery, and on the other hand, the national efficiency tension. Is there a role for tram train? Please, Vernon. Um, so, in, in the uh, Greater Manchester transport strategy, uh, there is discussion of how tram train uh, could play a part. Mm -hmm. On the chart that I showed earlier on, you'll see that, that Metrolink doesn't serve the northwest of, of the region and, um, and all of that. And what, what we're doing uh, at the moment is just looking at uh, what we might do with tram, train, metrolink um, extensions and things like that in the context of the city regional sustainable transport settlement mm -hmm. to see how we could extend that. So definitely tram, train is in the mix there. Okay. Thank you. Paul, I don't know if you yeah. want to make some remarks on the... Well, so it's, it's um, a sort of logical part of what we described as our market-led 
uh, approach to planning. And there may well be circumstances where uh, what the community, uh, the local uh, community needs, what, how it is best served, looking at sort of cost revenues and other, other factors, it, that might be the right um, public transport solution. Okay, thank you. Right, let me come to the room. Who have we got? Chris. Thank you, uh, Chris Kimberley. Um, thank you very much for the uh, very insightful presentations and the, and the comments. Um, I want to try and link very briefly some of the themes and then the question in this rethinking uh, perspective. So I want to try and re link together uh, value, which Bernard mentioned, I think the unit of analysis, Martin, you talked about, um, and also the people and, and collaboration points that have been made. And my, my question really is, if you think about um, the non-user benefits, the benefits that you're all describing in different ways that aren't captured through the, the fare box or the track access agreement, we often see when schemes are put forward that as part of the strategic case and the financial case, those benefits are put forward and uh, validated and schemes are, are backed on that. What we don't see very often, it seems to me, is when results are presented, those parties who have responsibility for capturing those non-user benefits playing their positioning back, how well is the scheme done? And I wonder whether, particularly in devolved uh, administrations like the combined authority now, there's something more that could be done to set up this sort of what winning looks like mm -hmm. in a way that messages and actually brings to life, not just what we put in the forward-looking, this is what the investment could achieve, but brings those parties to the table with their responsibilities and accountabilities, report on how well those economic or educational benefits are, are being captured. So, so my question really is, does, does the panel think in this rethinking space there might be a way to just reorientate something around the sort of dashboard of results? And that can motivate people then as well, because in this leadership vacuum we've got in the rail industry at the moment, at the very top, you know, the message I continually pick up as somebody who's been in the industry for over 40 years is it's the first time we've not really known what winning is. So that's, that's the theme, I suppose, for, of rethinking. And it's trying to get, I guess, the panel to think about the non-user benefits, the value, re-winning the argument. What, what, could we do, what could be done more in there through this yeah. collaboration, which is co-creation in reality. It's more than cooperation, it's co-creation of something. Sorry, long-winded question, yeah. but I hope that helps. Thank you. Who, who would like to start? Martin, you talked a lot about uh, this I, thing, I was going to say, you? I think this is one of the things where um, Transport for the North has a... A role to play um, because within my team I have something like 35 modelers, analysts, Social. scientists or what have you. It's why when we did our work on transport related social exclusion, mapping across the entire north at um, local super output area, so really quite detailed, we've got a, an analysis not only of what is currently there but we've got an analysis of what um, the level to which access to transport exists within households and communities. So it's not just talking about the availability, but the access to um, service. And I think that there is a role to play in using that as a foundation for saying, what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve in broad terms around society, um, environment and economic. So I think we've got a role to play to be able to help with the evidence base and be able to then make that available to partners. Um, and I think we've got to be, your, your point, Chris, I think it's really quite well made because we've got to be more comfortable demonstrating that linkage because a lot of the benefits for some of these um, uh, investments are felt in other parts of, 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 of um, the public policy area. The, the, the lovely example I like to use to kind of get that point across if I was in a pub is the, a, a National Health Trust mm. being prepared to pay a local highway authority to grit the pavements mm. because the cost of gritting was far less than the cost of repairing broken hips, broken legs. Mm. Now, we know some of these linkages. We've just got to get comfortable reaching out. I think we can help with that because transport doesn't respect individual boundaries um, and that's certainly an area where I want us to be pushing the playbook a little bit. One of the things I want our team to do is use the models we've got, use the analysis and society, social work we've got to, to develop a new playbook for what does a really 
pushing the envelope green book type analysis which brings in these wider societal environmental and use that as a playbook that we can get some confidence in if you apply this thinking and this approach you can embed it in the business case and once you've done that then it becomes easier to report against it I think. Okay thanks Martin. Werner did you want to come in on that? Well I only, um, only to vigorously agree uh, with, your, with your point and the, the only thing I'd say is as operators sometimes you don't have the data and one of the things that I'll just take a bus example at the moment we're now seeing how Wigan Bolton Salford and Bury works in terms of its bus network and how people travel times they travel what products they they provide and all the rest of it and in order to substantiate laying on more service for example we need to use an evidence base drawing from that to make that decision so I, you know, I, I think um, I, I think actually having the data, Metro, there have been some really good evaluations actually of what Metrolink extensions have done, particularly out to the airport, for example, in terms of GBA and and all of those things as well. But I think it goes back to my early, earlier point. I think we've lost the connection, and I think your point about providing the evidence is key to restoring it. Yeah, we were talking about it outside <coughs> actually, um, just rethinking um, the data. We did some work a couple of years ago to look at for every pound that you invest in Northern, because let's face it, the taxpayers are subsidising us to the tune of 650 million. So for every pound that you put in, we generate £2.50 of economic value. But we've taken that a little bit further and we published a social impact report this April and that is looking more like for every pound is actually equal to four pound when you bring in some of those wider society and, and environmental benefits and actually we've changed our dashboard internally. Um, we've always had customer service up there and as somebody who believes in customer service it was really hard for me to see that taken off the top of our, the north star of our dashboard, we've got a, you know, you can imagine customers, people, operational efficiency. We've now put economic value of us at the top of that uh, performance dashboard because that changes the way we think about our services. Okay, thanks. Um, Dan, I think you were next. Yeah, I Paul. think um, it just um, <coughs> ties in a little bit with the discussions around collaboration and partnerships that we had slightly earlier, because I think actually on the ground relationships with communities can help drive that economic um, results as well. And I think your example about gritting the roads there, Martin, a lot that can be transferred over to delivery of schemes by local communities in, yeah. involved in that. That has a knock-on effect potentially to performance, which has a knock-on effect to economic delivery and customer service as well. So um, I think we would encourage those com uh, conversations with communities about how they can actually tangibly be involved in that in that delivery. Thanks. And Paul? Yeah, I mean, we've done some, I think, some pretty good work about three years ago when Restoring Your Railways was sort of launched and then, you know, in sort of full... Uh, or fl flourishing, maybe, maybe it's been reinvigorated from last week, who, you know, who, who knows. Um, but looking at ma exactly the same stuff has been mentioned, sort of mapping um, access to rail uh, and, and so on, and, and using the indices of deprivation. So, I mean, you know, maybe there's, maybe people are doing lots of their own sort of bespoke analysis, so maybe they don't think to Martin's point, maybe it's something more about more of a common playbook, so you can talk, talk the sort of same language and present things in similar ways. Okay, thanks, Paul. Now, um, I've got a question here from online, which is related to some of some of the discussion that we've just had. So we've just been talking about perhaps a different approach to evidencing what we need to do. I think this question cuts to something very close to my heart and my work on Manchester Task Force, but also um, uh, a stage before we get to that. So. The question is this: the speakers have identified the importance of collaboration and the need for more. What's been the missing ingredient to date to make that happen? <laughs> Martin, would you so, like that? So, uh, haven't we collaborated always? I, 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 do, I do find it fascinating how, as a profession, we get hung up on phrases or trends for four or five years and then we move on. I, I, I work with you on the Manchester Recovery Task Force. Yeah. You know, um, we had Network Rail, we had 
TFGM, we had ourselves, we had the operators, we had, you know, we, had, we didn't have to be told to collaborate. We didn't have to be waiting for a piece of legislation to tell us to collaborate. We knew we needed to work together to achieve a common outcome. And so my, my, my slight worry about when we all get sort of talking about collaboration is, I, I think, again, it comes back to my point about language. Um, so uh, I just reflect on, uh, for me, there was always a bit of an inherent contradiction in, in some of the rail reform uh, ideas originally. You know, we wanted to simplify things, but we're going to talk to lots more people. And you kind of think, hang on a minute, it seems like <laughs> collaboration is being used to mean lots more conversations rather than effective collaboration, which is who needs to be in the room to be able to make a decision. And then there is a conversation about how you work with a wider group beyond that. But if we see collaboration as just about getting more people in the room to talk more often about more things, um, my worry is, as a public policy area, we're in danger of think forgetting those conversations represent an overhead on delivery. Mm -hmm. And if we think about this in terms of finance and resources being finite, shouldn't we be using collaboration to minimize the amount of time and the amount of resources to get to a good answer rather than the best answer? Good is being often the enemy, uh, sorry, the best being often the enemy mm. of the good. So I think, uh, don't get me wrong, I think collaboration is important, but I think we, we kind of know it when we see it and we're doing it. We don't need to be told to do it. Mm. We just get on and do it and facilitate it. And I think that's where we were talking before, and Richard, a lot of this is in our own gifts sometimes. Mm. We kind of, there's a, there's a phrase that many people are often used to saying, you know, you kind of uh, do something and then pray for forgiveness afterwards. And, and, you know, I think sometimes we just need to find our, our spirit to actually get on and do it. Paul, you wanted to go in? Yeah, I mean, I suppose Martin's sort of countering maybe a bit what I said. I mean, I would agree it's about effective collaboration. I, I would say, again, risk of sort of harking back is that if we don't collaborate effectively, we, we've seen ex some, some, some bad examples of what ca can happen. And, and the May 2018 timetable debacle is, is an example of that. Mm -hmm. I was Network Rail's strategic crisis uh, director, both pre-May 8 for bits of pre-May 18 and then following May 18 as we tried to recover the timetable nationally uh, and there were some, 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 some poor examples of collaboration pre-May 18. After it, I think there was a, a strong recognition, uh, unavoidable recognition across the industry of a, of a burning platform. Everybody came together and the collaboration was absolutely first class. Everybody uh, in, the, in the right space. So we're very good at it as an industry, sort of, you know, uh, when there's a crisis, when there's a burning platform, I think we just need to embed it and make it effective, you know, all the time and, and just double down on it. So, not to say there isn't a collaboration, of course there is, obviously there is. But it's, it's, it's more important than ever. Thanks, Paul. And Vernon, you wanted to add something? I, I don't think we're short of forums. <laughs> uh, uh, um, the, the, the thing I think we're probably short of is a single guiding mind. Uh, and and the you know it, it's it's I I really hope that we can vig reinvigorate the creation of a single guiding mind behind the rail industry, um, and um, also recognise that a lot of power is now being devolved to to regions and city mayors, politically accountable people, yeah. and they need to be involved. How much collaboration happened last week with those announcements, right? Not a lot, I can tell you. And we can't go on like that. We can't plan, we can't describe to the people we're supposed to serve what it is that we're here to do and how we're going to do it under those circumstances. So, single guiding mind for me, a regional lens, um, and very often you've been told what's good for you in the regions. And we can't have that anymore. Yeah. Thanks. Right, I'm going to come back to the room. Question in the room. Gentleman over here. Wait for the microphone. John Carr, uh, Director of the Association of Transport Coordinating Officers. Um, I'm old enough that probably my uh, entry into the transport planning profession uh, precedes 
anybody on the platform. And I look back, and I came into transport rather than making use of my physics degree in the 1960s because of what was around then in the Jack Report into Rural Transport and the Buchanan Report based on economic activity and cities. And, and both of them were, were pioneering reports. But I look now and I say the discussion we're having, is it focused on the right objectives? The situation we're in, we've got a target of net zero by some time, let's say, between 2035 and 2050. But whatever the timeline is, the reality is that human impact on the planet that we live on is going to make life as we know it unsustainable at some time in the remainder of this century. Therefore, shouldn't we be looking and saying, how are we going to change human behavior so that we get to that objective and don't end up committing climate suicide effectively? Mm. And I would say we've got to start looking at behavioral change and behavioral impact. I'll give you a good example of where I think the valuation we've been using has been wrong. In the um, early 2000s, a dial-a-ride service, and it was dial-a-ride because of some uh, um, telephones, was introduced in Flintshire to serve the industrial estate that had opened up on the site of the old shot and steel works. The major bus operator would not divert services off the A55 into it, even on a peak only basis. So David Blaney, the county council coordinator, decided that this was a good case for looking at what a dial -a ride service could do. Now, dial -a ride service, we all know, if we've been involved with bus planning, is a more expensive way of doing it than the conventional bus service, just from the fact that you've got to provide a control mechanism to take the calls and to do the bookings. Sorry, can I just come in? Can we, yeah. can we cut to the question? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the question is basically, when we looked at it from the lens of the uh, user, and we had good data over two years of virtually every user of the service, we found that three people were taken off the long-term unemployed register. They were worth, in terms of the good estimates that we could get, which were not very good at the time, about 7K a year to the economy. Mm -hmm. The service itself cost about 30K a year. So we'd got two-thirds of the cost was covered in social value, but no way of claiming that social value. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a point that Martin's already made, but we have to look at valuation. We have to encourage our modelers. We have to encourage Whitehall to look at cross the board and look at the values to, uh, to, to uh, UK PLC just as much as we look at the cost side. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry about the thank you. No, That's okay. So it's about value. Anyone want to add anything to that? Social value, environmental value. Tricia? Uh, well, I, I, I totally agree with you in terms of how do we change uh, customer behaviour. And we have to look at marketing. We have to look at how do we help customers make informed decisions, whether that's carbon calculators so that you can work out how do you make your journey more carbon um, efficient. And I think young people are going to demand that, actually. So um, totally agree with you. I think we need to encourage that modal shift. Some of that will be through clever marketing. Some of that will be through changing our rolling stock. Um, so we need to uh, change our diesel traction, and we're on with a, a strategy to do that. So yeah, totally agree with you. So, so I, I think, for me, come back to communities, because that's what you wanted to try and focus on here. Mm -hmm. Here's my challenge back to us again as a transport profession. How many people will quote at some point in their career, uh, travel is a derived demand, rule 101 of transport planning. 
understanding that we travel for a reason and for a purpose. So if we want to change some of this behaviour, we need to think about how people have access to services and how and where they are located. So my frustration is as a transport profession, we say travel is a derived demand. We then try and solve problems that exist because of other activities and other choices through transport. So we're contradicting ourselves as a profession. If we think about the way in which health services are provided, that has a major demand or major implication on how people travel. If we think about schools, if everybody had a quality school in their close proximity, you would go to your nearest school rather than feeling you have to travel 10 miles or 20 miles. We get, we get halfway there, but as a profession, we've got to follow through on some of this, and that's why rethinking is absolutely fundamental. Thanks, Martin. Dan, did you want to come in? Yeah, just really quickly. I think there's a, there's a lot to talk about in terms of the way commu the role communities can have in the actual deliveries, as I've said before. I think that net zero challenge, there are a lot of communities already stepping up to the mark. Lots of projects working with Northern, for example, on actually delivering that at a local level. And I think that voice of the community is really important because actually, how can you know where the gaps are in terms of the um, ability to access transport if you don't talk directly to the communities to deliver that? Okay. Thank you. Right, come to the room. Sharon. Uh, thank you. Sharon H is Transport Focus. Um, just a couple of reflections and then, a, then a, my main point. Um, we know that uh, rail drivers are very much around cost and convenience. Thank you, Paul, for mentioning the research we did with you, punctuality and reliability being important. Um, my sense, really, though, is that rail is still a minority sport. I don't think we can argue that bus certainly has had an image problem, and maybe things like the B network are going to change that. Um, clearly, the media backdrop for a lot of this is, is pretty, pretty negative and pretty challenging, and I think that's also an issue, um, actually, for in not just attracting passengers and usage, but also getting people to come into the industry. You know, why would you? It looks so messy. Mm. And I think, <clears throat> really, what I wanted to say is that I think it's incredibly important that people understand not just the needs of those current users, but non-users, and I think that's been alluded to. But my real question is, what is rail and what is transport going to do to win the hearts and the minds of people? Because the way we get around is clearly fundamental, and I think there's a bit of a gap there. Hearts and minds. Who wants to pick that up first? Vernon? Just a question of leadership at all levels, isn't it? If I look at Greater Manchester, we've got a mayor and 10 district authorities that are eulogising about this and saying we can't deliver all the objectives that we got for this region in terms of the economy, productivity, social inclusion, unless we get this stuff right. And I think it, need, it needs political leadership and needs money. Mm -hmm. And it needs to keep at it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone, everyone looks to London. I, I worked at Transport for London for 15 years. Enjoyed every minute of it. But remember, TfL got a head start, created the mayoralty in 2000, created a single point of political accountability for all transport, and then it was put alongside the spatial strategy and the economic strategy of London. And that is the magic ingredient, uh, I, I, I think. But it requires steady and sustained funding and clear leadership. Anyone else want to come in on that point? Okay, I'll well, go. Maybe um, go on, Paul. I can just build on what Vernon said. I mean, that, that stability is key. Having a, a clear direction of travel, so a long, you know, which then is is supported by having a long-term plan. How do you get a long-term plan? Rail reform, single guiding mine, GBR, whatever you want to call it, is you know, it's got to be key to that. Okay. Back out to the room. Question at the front, please. Hi, um, Elaine. Uh, the national and even global goals are around decarbonisation, reducing congestion, connection. And I wonder about collaboration outside of the rail industry to wider transport. Particularly in the north, we have lots of rural communities and often you do need a car. Vernon mentioned two-thirds travel by car. So what is being done about talking to um, uh, and thinking about charge and ride, so electric vehicles encouraging people to go to a train station maybe and, and pick up the train instead of driving all the way into the city centre to reduce um, congestion and increase uh, patronage. And also thinking about car sharing, so rather than just electrifying cars, um, reducing the number of cars by facilitating car sharing hubs um, and, um, what's it called, 
uh, car clubs as well, so peer-to-peer -peer as well as um, um, enterprise car clubs. Is that something that's being thought about and collaborated with? Thank you. So modal integration, essentially, but use of station assets in that way as well. So, Tricia, you want to come on that? Yeah, we, we've looked at a number of these um, uh, initiatives and we've collaborated with local authorities. Um, we have a, uh, a park and ride facility for a new housing estate in Cotton Parkway, for example. Um, I haven't heard the car share one, so that might be a good one for us to look at. But things like... Um, e-bikes and bike store so that we can get that integrated transport um, that really reflects the local community um, because every station for example is different we've got small stations we've got with, with no facilities around and that's where you can really create station as a as a community hub but you've got big stations you know particularly in this area where there's you know there's shops very local so you you maybe want to use the station estate in a, in a slightly different way and we can only really look at that and integrate that by collaboration uh, to use a much used term already but but working with local authorities working with um, combined authorities uh, to see where our place is within that so Martin, i've been quite deliberately provocative for the, the industry, and I think I'll push back again on this. First of all, understand why people are choosing to travel the way they are, they are choosing. So um, the example I use when we, we try to get across how I think the profession's got it wrong, I've been in many conversations around decarbonisation, and we'll talk, well, you are here, people talk quite eloquently and quite rightly about things like EVs, and my pushback is, okay, I pick a town at random. Imagine you're a single parent on a zero hours contract on minimum wage in red car. What has that got any meaning for if you're talking to them about EVs as a way of decarbonizing? We have to understand what it is that individual, what are the things that drive individual choices? It's great to talk about car clubs. Three years ago, two years ago, suggesting you were going to share a car with somebody else would be a public health no-no. So we've got to turn it around. We've got to think about what is it that, that the factors that influence people's choices. It'll be about their lifestyles. It'll be about their, uh, what, they're, what, they're, their, what they're, they're trying to do in their lives. It'll also be about some of the... Um, it's also taking account of wider factors. So as a profession, we often talk about the need for diversity in, in the profession, which is great. I want, I want to see more diverse voices in the profession. But there's absolutely no excuse why 100% of the profession now uses the data available to understand how cultural factors and fears about safety may affect a significant part of a population's choice on travel. How other factors might influence choices. These, this data is actually available. It's, a, it's why I kind of phrased it in the way that we've got to reframe the question. I've, I, I've written peer reviews for, for papers, and, and, and I had one that came up, with, and it was, it was a wonderful story about how uh, a community had done a fantastic work around uh, encouraging greater use of cycling. They then tried to take that template and applied it in a community with a different cultural background, where that sense of reliving your childhood by going back had absolutely no meaning at all. Now, in my view, as a profession, there is no excuse to have got it so badly wrong, because we have got access to data about cultural, society, ethnic. We've got, the, we've got access to that information. We know it is a factor. So how are we getting it so fundamentally wrong that we apply a template in one community to another where it's a very different set of circumstances. So I, I kind of just, I keep pushing back. We as a profession have to reframe and rethink the way we do it. We've got access to information, we've got access to data, but if our driving figure, our headline is wrong, as I said, we'll head off in a completely wrong direction with immense speed and more worryingly, the communities will say, well, you're the experts, <coughs> but you're not helping us. So what relevance have we got? So there's a real challenge for us as a community, as an experience, to say, this is not us telling you what to do, it's us understanding what you're trying to achieve 
and working with you to make your objectives. Thanks, Martin. Dan? Just coming in on that, I think um, that's, that's absolutely the case. And I think we need to be considering rail confidence as part of a sustainability question. Um, there are lots of our members who run lots of different initiatives, whether it's taking refugees out on the train, whether yep. it's taking young people from inner cities who've never used yep. a service before. And I think we need to consider that and promotion confidence as part of the sustainability question. I couldn't agree more. You did, didn't you do some fat, um, work recently about, or maybe a year or so ago, about the pro proportion of teenagers who have never been anywhere near a rail station? Absolutely, and we've seen lots of projects dotted around the country with people, there's a good example in Bristol where they've taken probably over a hundred young adults, let's say between 14 and 18, out onto the trains for the first time. And a lot of the results of that are people getting jobs in places they didn't know that they could get a job. Something as simple as that. So um, we, we are thinking of that very much as part of a, how do we encourage sustainability. It isn't just a cycle rack. That's great and that's part of it, but it is about making rail an option. Yeah. That's really good. Right, we've got time for a couple more quick questions. I think we've got one over here. Yep. Morning. Uh, Tom Davidson from Steer. Um, we've heard from the panel around the benefits of good collaboration, some of the threats around too much collaboration or too much consultation, potentially. We've heard about the benefits of a single, accountable political system uh, that's there in London. And we've heard about the need for a single guiding mind. Um, how do you see politics and railway planning uh, fitting together in the future, potentially improving some of the structures that, we, that we've had in the past? Okay. Vernon, would you like to start on that? Well, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to repeat myself a little bit, uh, but I think uh, what, 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 are the thing, what are the things that need to be true in order to enable us to move this whole weather front forward? And it is a, a stable political outlook and steady and sustained funding to get it done. And it, 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 it's easy to say, but the hardest thing in the world to actually secure, as, as recent events have demonstrated. So um, I, I, I just hope, whatever, this isn't a, a partly political statement at all, whichever, whatever colour of government uh, forms the next government. We just need a serious discussion about steady and sustained funding and having clarity of where we're, we're heading. And it does have to recognise uh, and view things from a regional lens. When, when I first came to, to start working in Greater Manchester, it took ages to get a single story for the impact of all the different rail schemes, what impact they would have on this region, because you've got trains plan on route upgrade, which is great, but because you're capacity constrained in and around Greater Manchester, there's no point firing more trains into a capacity constrained central Manchester. So how are we going to deal with that then? And, and then we had HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail and all the rest of it, and having to piece all of that together was, was arduous, frankly. So. You know, we, we just need we, we need some serious listening and uh, recognition of what needs to happen regionally, I think, um, because it works with the grain of where we're going with the political system of devolution. And, and if I might, I think that's... I, I completely agree with that, because I think that's where the leadership's being provided by the MCAs is, is absolutely clear, because it's fo focused on place, and people relate to place, where they live, where they work, where they go about, where they meet their friends. And I think where TFN then adds just that little bit of oversight is how do you can make sure the connections with Manchester, Sheffield or Newcastle with and it doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be a light it doesn't need to heavy touch, it's a light touch complementing what is being done at the city region. I, I agree, you have to you have to look at it on a on a you know, this isn't just about about the regions. The one thing I would say though is that I think one of the ways in which we connect the pipes up and, and, and re inter-regionally, if you look at what's happening in the Liverpool city region, they're going for bus, bus um, franchising. They have got battery-powered trains that they run themselves. If you look at the West Mids, got their own rail network, going for integrated ticketing. Everyone regionally is doing 
broadly similar things, recognising their local contexts. I think building out from that is going to make it easier then to start connecting the pipes up regionally between Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds and going across the Pennines. Yeah. And we need to recognise that as well. Okay, thank you. Just looking around the room, um, a final question here. One to hopefully tie things together. So Steve Brown from Real Aspects. Um, we saw the interesting research about what passengers say uh, say about why they travel by train or don't travel by train. I'd just be interested in a quick perspective from each of you on people who don't travel by train and what they might say and whether it might be different. Okay, quick comment. So we'll start with Paul and come this way. Quick comment from everybody and then... We'll what they might them. say. Um, well, cynics will say, well, you know, you're taking money out of my, uh, my, my paycheck or my pension to support something that I don't, I don't use and it's, it's over, overpriced. The counter to that, of course, would be is all about the wider economic benefits, the opportunities of connectivity, educational um, um, you know, links, jobs, growth, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we've, we've been through that a lot. But you can see where a, you know, a, you know, a cynical or, or negative view comes from. Um, I think step one is their current behaviour. So people's current use of, of, of transport, whether that's driving, whether that's how, how they get around, it's quite difficult to get people out of their initial idea of how they, they move because we are, as people, I think, quite set in our ways generally. So there is a, you know, we've talked a little bit about that behavioural change. I also think you, you've got to mention about how accessible our service is. There are lots of us who, for whatever reason, may not be able to use that train um, because it's not accessible, because there's not step-free access, because the train doesn't suit them. And I think we've got to be talking to those communities and those people to find out that a little bit more as well. And I think that, in some ways, that's where CRPs, community rail partnerships, come in, because they are the voice of the community and they are talking to their members and lots of people within the community and understanding that and driving their own behaviour based on those conversations that they have. Great. Fern? I, I agree with that point about accessibility. Um, Many people don't think the railways are for them because there are too many barriers in the way, you know, literal barriers for, for people using the railways. The other thing is price and the other thing is the complexity of the fare system. There, there are about, uh, I think, about 15 different fares from central Manchester to the airport and it depends on what time of day, which way you're facing, you know, and, and it, it's a serious, I think, Alongside all of the infrastructure stuff we've been talking about today and all of that, we've just got to recognise that if you make it complicated for people to use something, they won't use it. Mm -hmm. So we've just got to sim try and simplify everything. Simplification. Martin? So I, I, would, I would echo what others have said. I think in terms of if you're trying to convey to somebody why rail's important, um, think of it this way. You know, if I'm somebody who's got no option but I have to use the M62 to get across the Pennines, knowing that if I connect by rail Immingham and the Humber ports with the port of Liverpool, I can take a substantial amount of the freight traffic that's currently on the, the M62 to make it available for use for people who have no option, you know, then you start reframing the question. It's not about saying, you, you have to make a choice one way or the other. You're talking about there's a transport system. We have to meet the needs of our communities, the economy, individuals. And you start having a different conversation. Um, and I think that's where the challenge for us is about reframing the question, making it relevant to people's lives, making it relevant to individuals' lives. And then you can start saying, well, the reason why we're making this investment over here is actually, do you know what? It has a bit of a benefit over here for you. Patricia. I'll just reframe the question. What we know is that the highest level, the, the reason, the biggest reason why people are not satisfied with rail is performance. So we have to improve performance. We have to improve reliability. Thank you. Um, lots to think about. Lots to rethink. Yeah, it's all perfectly straightforward. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Can I just have a big thank you for our panel? So finally, can I just remind you that the third and final session in this Rethinks Room series is next week, a week today, on the 18th of October in London, uh, and it's exploring the theme of serving our passengers. 
Um, finally, in addition to a big thank you to, to our panel, can I thank all of you um, in the room and everyone online as well um, for the contribution that you've made to what has been a really interesting discussion this morning. Please share your reflections. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback on today's event. Hopefully we'll see you again next week. So thank you all and thank you and good morning. Thank you. Yeah, we got that slightly wrong, I think. <laughs>